what a good mask. Or unless somebody got a bunch of masks they want to donate to him. It's so good to see you in the Lord's house this morning. I appreciate all the excitement. And God is good all the time. All the time. We're actually glad that we're getting back to our old selves. I don't know if that's good or bad, but we all get back to our old selves. Uh, Miss Diane is going to be doing our special music this morning. She'll have one song. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make the announcements, and then we're going to have a video for our call to worship. I know everyone is missing their choir music. So we're going to have a choir. I flew, I flew them all the way from Dallas, Texas. And they're going to do our special this morning. And then we'll have our prayer time after the call to worship music, okay? But let me go over a couple of announcements, okay? I was given this card, I think, Teresa, was a Wednesday night? And uh, it's, let me just read it to you. I have about four down here that came from Miss Linda, but it says, Dear Senator Graham, every day thousands of unborn babies are cruelly destroyed by abortion. I got to start this. I'm sorry. Now, uh, every day thousands of unborn babies are cruelly destroyed by abortion on demand. Abortion's death toll has now reached more than 62 million in this country alone. I'm disappointed that in this Congress you have yet to co-sponsor the Life at, Life at Conception Act, which declares that life begins at conception and would use the Supreme Court's own language to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, at your, as your constituent, I urge you to co-sponsor the Life at Conception Act, and then it gives a number at once. You sign your name to this, you put your return address, and it's addressed to the Honorable Lindsey Graham of U.S. Senate. Now, if somebody would like to take some of these cards, you have to use card stock now and make some more of these. Uh, I'm going to keep this up here at the pulpit to do so with. But if you'd like to get one and mail it in today, there's about three or four laying down on the table here, okay? All right, let's move right along. This morning, following our worship service, we're going to have a short business meeting. We need to consider officers for next year and also our budget for next year. And the Properties Committee has something that they would like to present that we would like to get the ball rolling on uh, in order to get it up for homecoming. Uh, so if you can, if you're a member and you'd like to stay around for that, we'd appreciate it. I want to let you know that August, our mission opportunities are as follows. The Children's Church is sponsoring uh, uh, Christmas in August. I do not have a list of their items. Is it anywhere in the church or in the back of what they're collecting? Does anybody know? Basically school things right now. Like I can't hear you because you mask. School items. School items. Thank you very much. So if you yeah. have some school yeah. items that you'd like to donate to be sent to a missionary somewhere in the United States, bring them and there's a box in the, in, the, in the usher's room that you can drop those items off to. We're also sponsoring a canned good uh, collection for the, the Samaritan House. It is reopening the 1st of August. It was the first time it's reopened in a while, and they're collecting food for the homeless. If you would like to help, through the month of August, bring a canned good, and it is collected in the usher's room also. Any questions on any one of those missions? All right, then we get into September. We have our Daz Walk. If you would like to sponsor, there's some sheets next to the usher's basket on your way out. Uh, it's going to be Saturday, September the 19th. And you can sign up, and, and if you'd like to help or just give money toward anyway, the sponsorship, there's four levels. The lowest is 250 the highest I think is 5000 Is that right? No. Where's that? Somewhere. The lowest is 300 for a 300 okay. And what's the highest? I believe it's 1000 1000 okay. Thank you very much. But anyway, if you would like to help, uh, Daphne is collecting money toward that. And you can give it to her, and that will go as a collection to Providence Baptist Church, okay? I want to remind you that we're going forward with homecoming. Now, two Sundays ago, I asked if there were some people who was willing to donate a tent. Ten people raised their hand. I hope you remember who you were, because we're counting you on your tent. We're going to put up ten tents outside, and there will be a table under each tent, and that is going to be our homecoming service, and that's our, I'm sorry, September the 20th. Okay, worship service begins at 10.30 on that particular day. There will not be any Sunday school per se, okay? 
worship out here with the showers, and then at the top of the hour we'll begin our worship hour and go through 12 o'clock. And uh, it'll be advertised, and there will be a uh, there'll be things told that you need to bring. Everyone is asked to bring a collection, uh, uh, a, a plate of food. Okay? All right. Make sure you wash your hands before you bring it. Any other announcements? All right. I've already told you how good you look. So let's enjoy this video. First Baptist Church of Dallas Choir. So, Harry, if you will hit that and turn the volume up, pump up the volume, as they say. Please. So, let me hear it on Facebook.
We have several people to lift up to the Lord this morning. Let's remember our sister uh, Linda Hooker. Understand that she did take her treatment. She's lost almost or up to 50 pounds since uh, the ongoing of her uh, troubles. So continue to pray for her as she is taking her treatment. I want to pray for Brother Shannon Bennett. Uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, this is a private, personal uh, issue, but just pray for Brother Shannon. Pray for Bud and Diane. Continue to lift them up to the Lord and uh, as God continues to work in their lives uh, through the chemotherapy. Joe and Linda World. Joe is continuing his second round of treatment. So bless uh, them. Pray for them and ask God to bless them. Pray for the COVID patients. We have a good many, uh, just all, almost too many to mention, and some are private, so we don't want to mention those uh, that have been touched by this. But uh, just pray for this as it affects our nation, and especially our church. We want to pray for our church in this time of trial. Uh, did I tell you lately how much I love you? It is so good to see you in God's house this morning. I appreciate you more than you'll ever know. And those out in the parking lot, I appreciate you too. Blow your horn. And hear no horn. Y'all hear horn? There's a couple out there, I know. So. They are. Pray for the front line workers, the nurses, and the doctors, and the EMTs, and such, pharmacists, and such. Ask for God to bless them. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together. As our heads and our hearts are bowed before the throne of God, perhaps you individually have a personal request you'd like to make known to God by lifting up the hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hands going up all over the congregation. Heavenly Father, you're our God. We're your people. Lord, some of us started this journey years ago, some of us more frequent. But Lord, you have been in our corner through thick and thin. We have been through many storms, dear God. We have never went through a storm like we're going through now. But Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient. You promised Paul that, and he's one of your servants, and we are too, that your grace is going to be sufficient for every battle that we face. I pray tonight, this morning, Lord, that you would just take the hearts and lives of the prayers that's being sent up to you. You would bless them. You would cleanse the hearts that's making these prayers, that they would be acceptable. And that you would touch each and every one of these lives, Lord. I ask your hand, dear God, and minister, Father, with mercy, and kindness, and gentleness. And I pray, Father, as Christians, dear Lord, that you will help us, Father, to walk the steps that some of these people walk. Help us to empathize, Father, with the things that are going through, and make us a caring church, a, live, a loving church, and a church that reaches out to people during their sickness. I bless each and every one of us this morning. Fill this place with your presence. Fill those, Lord, who are listening online. May they feel the presence of the Holy Spirit as they privately worship with us, as they worship with their family, Lord. I ask your, your ministering spirit just to be real to them in this hour. And bless us, Lord, because we're yours. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Now, this guy is going to entertain us, so I, I'm sorry, that bad word, is going to minister to us with the first song of the
25 in reverence to God and His Holy Word. May we stand together as we read. We're going to read verses 1 through 13, and our text comes right out of the middle of this, verse 6. It is the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. I'm going to explain a little bit beforehand because I'm not going to get into much detail about the parable itself. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their laps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go out to meet him. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, No, lest there should not be enough for us, and you but go, and you go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came in, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came and said, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said unto him, Assuredly I said unto you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know not when. The day or the hour in which the Son of Man comes. This is a parable pointed toward the Jewish nation. And Jesus was telling them how inadequate the Jewish religion was. Friends, that fits the bill for everybody today who claims to be a religious follower of Jesus Christ. You see, all in the Bible is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And the only way that you will be prepared to meet the Lord Jesus Christ is by having the Holy Spirit in your life. It matters not what denomination you're a member of. It matters not how many times you've been baptized, what office you've held, how many times you've uh, preached and teached in Sunday school or anything like that. Your religion is vain unless the Holy Spirit is in your life. Amen. The Holy Spirit prepares you for the coming of the bridegroom. Lord, we ask that you would bless the preaching and the reading of your word this morning. We want to talk, Lord, this morning about the glorious church, the body of Christ that you're coming to receive into your own. I pray that every ear that hears will open their hearts to receive what the word of God says to them this day. Christ be honored and glorified above all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Be seated. I want to share with you three very brief points this morning concerning the glorious church. I want to talk to you about the glorious past of the church. I want to talk to you about the glorious present of the church. And then I want to talk to you about the glorious future of the church. First of all, let's examine the glorious past of the body of Christ. The body of believers, the called out ones that God has gloriously saved and called His church. On the day of Pentecost, friends, the Holy Spirit came and that was the birthday of the church. They continued growing as we read in the book of Acts. You can see how they went into Antioch in Turkey and there in the church of Antioch, brothers and sisters, they were first called Christians and the name stuck and it's been with us throughout this time. God had compelled the people of God to go, to go to all the known world and make the gospel known. And so the people of God did just that. They went to Asia, they went to Europe, and everywhere they went, brothers and sisters, they went with a, with a great commission to share with all the world about the Lord Jesus Christ. They took the great commission seriously, and they were going to risk life or limb, no matter what it took, to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as they did in the book of Acts, they went from city to city, from town to town. They built churches, they built missions, they built communes, they helped the poor, they spread the gospel, they showed the gospel to everyone they could, and they built tremendous buildings for the glory of God. Some small and some big. Now, I'm told that if you drive through Europe, you can see, friends, in every city, this mass cathedral standing up with the, with the steeple touching the sky as a representation that God one time visited these particular buildings and particular churches. 
I'm told that even after the war had come and destroyed them, the town people made a resolve to rebuild these cathedrals and, and let everyone see and know that God at one time had visited this particular town and that he was welcome in these towns. I heard Billy Graham say one time, he said, it's not like that anymore. People don't build grander buildings anymore. He said, if you go to a town, you don't see the cathedral standing above the highways or above the skyways, rather. You see banks. And so that has changed the philosophy of the world from worshiping God to making money. But the, the gospel continued to grow. It went throughout Europe, over into Britain. And then all of a sudden, brothers and sisters, the, the people of God began a migration to the new world. Well, when they came to the New World and they set foot on the New World, the mission didn't change. They said, oh, there's some Indians out there. we got to go westward. we got to plant churches in every city. There's people that's never heard the gospel. They don't know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They've never heard such. And so they continued to go and they continued to build. They knew, friends, that in this great world that we call the United States, in this great land that we live, they knew that every city needed a church and every soul needed a Savior. Amen? Amen? Consider, if you will, a man by the name of Amos Rook. You've heard about him in the history of Providence Baptist Church. The first, one of the first deacons of Providence Baptist Church and the very first man that was ever ordained in 1868. He came to the church and said, I have a vision. I want to go westward. I want to start a church for the Lord. And you know what? He ended up in a little town right outside of Galveston, Texas, and there he started the church. He's buried, friends, right there in the cemetery. Now, the church name changed over the years. It became something else from what it was. But you know what? A few years ago, we sent Bob on a mission. They had been, had damage from a storm, and we sent some money. said, we want to help because Amos Rook was the first pastor of this church, and we wanted to keep our connection there and gave him a $2,000 check. And now, friends, that little mission, friends, that, that, that Providence sent these folks on to Texas, you can set three of these churches in that. You see, that's the way the gospel goes, brothers and sisters. Just continue to reaching people, building churches, saving souls, and we have a glorious past. You probably don't know it because we don't celebrate a lot of it, but you know, we just recently celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. The Pro that's why you're here today, brothers and sisters. Because we broke with the Catholic Church and became Protestants, believing salvation is through faith, by, or by grace through faith, and today it continues. Thank God that we got a glorious past. We ought to look to our past. We ought to appreciate our past. We ought to love our past as a, as a Christian, as a church, and as a nation, or as a convention and as a nation. But we also have a glorious present. You know, there was a time in the 50s and 60s the people believed the only thing that God blessed in the church was a piano and organ. That's the only thing that God blessed. Oh, if you ain't got a piano and organ, you can't get no music for God. But look where we've come today. Now we have drums, we have guitars, we have full orchestras, as we just saw on the screens a minute ago. Today, friends, the church has taken on a different identity. We have the internet church. We got the satellite church. We got the, uh, uh, the warehouse church. And it goes on and on and on. Even preachers have taken on a different identity. You don't have to preach in a coat and a tie, brother. Let some of these uh, big name churches, big name preachers, blue jeans and a t-shirt is good enough. I guess today I take the position of Paul did back in the book of Philippians chapter 1. He says, listen, as long as the gospel is being preached, he says, I know some folks ain't going to worship with me, ain't going to come to my church and all like that, but I'm happy if the gospel is being preached and souls are being saved. So that's all I say about that, okay? We don't worship together, but as long as the gospel of Jesus Christ is going out and people are being saved, I am happy. Amen. Now, personally, personally, I've always believed that the church was a cut above the world, okay? And I've always believed that the country clubs can have a dress code, the church should have one. Now that don't mean that you have to dress like the preacher. You don't. But you ought to dress in the best that you have to come worship the God that you love with all of your heart that has done so much for you. Amen? Amen. And so I want to make a personal contract with you this morning. Okay? I really ain't considered, uh, concerned 
and what you put on to come to the house of God, but I do want to make a personal contract with you. 44 years ago, I started out preaching in the coat and tie. When I die, I'm going to be preaching in the coat and tie. So I'm going to keep my coat and tie when I stand in this holy pulpit and preach the holy word of God. And the contract is this. You don't come to my church in pajamas and curlers. That okay? Because I just don't believe that that's your best. I just don't do it. But look at what the church has become today. Now, when we think of the church, the music reflects a good bit on our walk with God. If you will dig deep into some of the modern music today, you don't find a lot of theology. You really don't. Now, don't get me wrong. I love praise music. There's nothing better in this world than good praise music. But friends, there ain't nothing worse in the world than bad praise music. Okay? I love the theology of the old song. I mean, like I said, it probably don't matter to you to heal the bends. But I'm a preacher. Theology is all that I'm about. And when I look at a song, I want to know what that song says from the top to the bottom. And what it says and means, friends, and what you can grasp out of it and how well it feeds the soul to get you through troubled times. And so I like the theology of songs like, It is well with my soul. Oh, that's as scriptural as you can get, and it gets down to the inner parts of your soul, and it talks about your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I like the theology of songs like, How Great Thou Art. Amen? Amen. Amen. You just can't get any better than that. You really, really can't. Well, I said all that to say this. Today, the church is alive. Amen? Amen. It is alive. 47,000 Baptist churches in the United States. Praise God. There are 194 nations as we speak today throughout the world, and there is at least one Baptist church in every nation. Now, listen. Baptisms in the Southern Baptist, you see, I don't have the numbers on all these other congregations, but I do have the numbers on what Southern Baptist is about. Okay? Baptisms this is an all-time low. Not since the end of the war in 1944 have we had such a low number of baptisms in the Baptist church. In 1944, there was 219,000 baptisms. In 2019, there was 235,000 baptisms. That's the lowest number in that 74-year span. You see, that's why the Lord prayed and said, listen, you need to raise up laborers. He says, my fields are white with harvest, but I need laborers. I need more preachers and I need more missionaries. So stand up and say, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because Lord, you have simply said to pray for God to raise up laborers in his harvest. Maybe I'm preaching right now to the next pastor of Providence Baptist Church. Maybe I'm preaching right now to those missionaries that God is going to burn a fire in your heart and brand you up and say, I've got to go because God is not going to let me alone till I do go. Friends, that's what we're all about. Missions and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and reaching souls for Christ. Now, I know the numbers are down. But let me suggest to you a couple of reasons why they're down. Every year, friends, since 1974, there's been close to 200,000 babies that's been killed in America. How many of those souls, friends, when they reach the age of accountability, would have loved to be baptized in the name of Jesus? How many of those souls, friends, that Satan, and that's the work of Satan, stomped their lives out, God had already ordained them to be preachers and missionaries? Amen. Friends, that's a sin on the blight of America's mission for the gospel. Well, think about it this way. 47,000 plus are standing up right now somewhere, somewhere on the other side of the world. They'll be preaching in a few hours. But they're standing up, brothers and sisters, and I hope most of them are preaching a gospel message. A message about how people need Christ. And in a little while, friends, they'll give an invitation. And maybe, friends, just maybe, during those invitation times, in those 47,000 47, plus churches, 
maybe a few souls will come to know Jesus Christ. When you think that and put that in perspective of the 3,000 that came to the Lord on the day of Pentecost, if every church just had one saved on that particular Sunday, friend, that's 47,000 people saved on one Sunday. Friend, I believe that. I believe that. Now, maybe they don't respond openly that day, brothers and sisters, but the seeds of the gospel has been planted into the hearts of the people that listen to the gospel as it's being proclaimed. And somewhere, brothers and sisters, along the way of life, God is going to knock you down and He's going to say, you need to respond to what that preacher was saying. Amen. Now, personally, I'm facing a trial in my life. I started preaching the gospel 44 years ago. Never, never in 44 years of preaching have I ever gone a year without baptisms. This August, if August ends, I would have gone through an entire year without a single baptism in my ministry. Now, I've had two that has came to make profession of faith, but they, and they were going to be baptized, but they're moved away. But, old oh, brothers and sisters, that tears at the heart of a preacher. Now, it's a strange time that we live in. Very strange. Giving in the Southern Baptist Convention is an all-time high. Attendance in the Southern Baptist Convention and church is an all-time high. But baptisms is at an all-time low. Think about that for just a minute. God raise up laborers, give us ministers, call that one and this one to the gospel ministry, and Lord, let them answer the call. May they hit the ground running, and Lord, may you use them to win countless numbers to Christ. Friends, let me tell you something. If the world keeps going, God has got to raise up preachers and missionaries to keep the fires going. And I'm probably talking to some of them this morning. That's right. Don't get settled in your little money-making job. Amen. It ain't about money making money and building the house and raising the family. It's all about obeying the will of God with your life. Amen. Well, that's the church. That's the glorious presence of the church. We're here. We're happy. But we can do better. What about the glorious future? The text says the bridegroom came out. We know that's Jesus. And he cried at midnight. The bridegroom comes. Oh, brothers and sisters, but hearts were not ready. Now, they had religion, but they did not have the Holy Spirit in their life. Friends, the glorious future is this. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Let me tell you something. A lot of preachers have gotten into a lot of trouble trying to predict the coming of Jesus. They look at this situation in the world and that situation and say, oh, he's coming tomorrow, he's coming tomorrow. Jesus made it very plain. Of that day or hour knows no man, not even the angels that are in heaven. Amen. Friends, just as sure as we're gathered here today, there's going to be a day, brothers and sisters, when the glorious church is going to leave this world. Amen? Amen. Christians from every nook and cranny on the globe will be taken away. Amen. It's going to be worldwide. How do we know? Because Jesus said there's going to be two working in the field. One will be taken and there will be one left. There will be two in the bed sleeping. One will be taken and the other one left. There's a school in West Virginia, special needs children. It's a Christian school, and they house these children, and they teach them the best they can. But every day, brothers and sisters, they teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ, who one day is going to break open the eastern sky, is going to appear and make them all whole again. Yeah. And they say that on the window panes of this school, there's nose marks for those little children running and presses their nose and mouth and looks up into the blue sky thinking that maybe this is the day that Jesus will come and make them whole. Hey. Really, let me tell you something. Listen to me. I serve a God that when He comes back to this earth, He's going to take all the wrongs and make them right. Amen? Amen. Not just a few, but all the wrongs will be made right. I think about my little precious Alexis. She's never been able to make a 
sinners, but brothers and sisters, when Jesus comes back, she's going to be made whole, and I'm going to get to hear her say for the very first time, I love you, Papa. I love you, Grandmama. Oh, brothers and sisters, and I can't wait. I'm telling you, I'm telling you again, He's going to make all wrongs right. Not part of them. All the wrongs will be made right when Jesus returns. There's a preacher in my home church, a man by the name of James Huey. I used to listen to his broadcast on WPCC in Clinton, South Carolina when I was driving to work. Every morning, Monday through Friday, he would come on at 6 o'clock and share the gospel. He had a theme song that you could hear that was very familiar as he started the day talking about the Lord and the theme song of his, message, of, of the, of his radio broadcast was sung golden daybreak. Some golden daybreak Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak battles all won. He'll shout the victory break through the blue. Some golden daybreak me and for you. Oh, brothers and sisters, it's going to happen. It's going to happen just as sure as we're sitting here today. Did you know there are people who actually believe that when all this starts transpires, they're going to have time to get right with God? They, they really believe that. Oh, yeah, he, he starts. I'm going to pray. I'm going to make it into heaven. Jesus said this. He said, I'm coming as a thief in the night. My first church was Langston Baptist Church. The nearest member lived seven miles away. The little country church. One Sunday morning we got to the church and turned on the spigot for flush to come over or something. There wasn't no water. Well, we got investigating. We looked out there at the well house and somebody in the middle of the night had come and stole the well pump. Now, if we'd have known he was coming, we'd have made him there. But he was a thief. And he came when nobody was looking. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, you hear me good. Jesus is coming as a thief of the night. He's given you and he's given this world ample time to prepare your hearts to get ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ right now. So let me make it plain as I get ready to close. Musicians, will you come to the instruments, please? Listen to me. I'm going to make it as plain as I can. <laughs> to everybody that's listening in, the, in this sanctuary, by the internet, or whoever, where? Get right or get left. That's it. How is your heart this morning? Do you know Jesus Christ? I want you to stand with me with your heads bowed. I just kind of read the words of this song, some go to the name of If you don't know Christ, I want you right now where you are to ask Jesus into your heart. Maybe you're a Christian, you've been doing all the religious things that you're supposed to do, but there's doubt in your heart about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, where you stand, I want you to say, Lord, I want to make things right with you. Come into my life. Forgive me my sins. I want to be ready when you come. Let's play and sing. Listen to the words. Some glorious morning sorrows will cease. Some glorious morning all will be peace. Heartaches all ended. School days all done. Heaven Oh!
changed in a moment, like him to be. Oh, glorious daybreak, Jesus I see. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Dun daybreak, battles all won. He'll shout the victory, break through the blue. Some golden daybreak for me and for you. Oh, what a meeting there in the skies. No tears, no crying shall dim our eyes. Loved ones united, eternally. Oh, what a daybreak that morning will be. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all won. He'll shout the victory. This morning, if you've made a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to find me before this service is over. If you're listening by way of the internet, I want you to Facebook me. It's just send me a message and tell me I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've got some things I want to mail you and send you. So just, just would you get in touch with me some way? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the crowd today. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's real and it's true. I ask you, Lord, to pierce it into our hearts. May we live for thee, Lord, until you come again. Forgive us for our failures, Lord. Help us to make our church glorious in the present. Now, Lord, bless us as we go into our business meeting, Lord. May your uh, name be honored. And may the things, Lord, that you want done in the Providence Church be taken care of. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. I know